Hello and welcome to the news at 7 on NT International. I am Lami Ali. Franklin Ife is the sign language interpreter. We begin with the trending stories. Federal government condemns the ill treatment of the super eagles in Libya ahead of 2025 African qualifier. The 2024 Africa Climate Forum underway in Abuja, focusing on how Africa can explore and build resilience. Also on the news, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, stresses urgent need for ceasefires in Lebanon and Gaza. And we begin with sports. Chairman House Committee on Sports, Kabiru Madu, has condemned the ill treatments of the Super Eagles in Libya ahead of Tuesday's Afghan qualifiers in Benghazi. Kabiru, in a statement, notes that the lives of persons in the Nigerian delegation was endangered by abruptly diverting their flight to another airport one hour to landing in Benghazi. He says the ill treatment by the Libyans has gone beyond antics of teams to unsettle their opponents, stressing that the action of the Libyan government puts a dent on the image of football on the continent. The chairman of the House Committee on Sports, however, praised the Super Eagles players for their tenacity and patriotic spirit, assuring the team that the Nigerian government will always give priority to their safety. Now, CAF begins investigations into the Super Eagles' inhuman treatment incidents at the Libyan airport. Bright Ebocho reports that reactions from different quarters condemned Libyan airport authority to the dehumanizing treatments. The Nigerian Super Eagles and their officials are returning home from Libya after the Libyan government denied the Nigerian nation access to the team for over 16 hours following their arrival. Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs Yusuf Chuga stated that the Libyan authorities have not yet allowed the Nigerian mission to reach the location where the Super Eagles are being held. Reports indicate that the Super Eagles chartered flight was redirected from its intended destination as it began its descent into Libya, following instructions from the Libyan government. Upon landing at a location chosen by the Libyan authorities, the players and officials were left in an abandoned airport for more than 14 hours without any provisions. Meanwhile, Minister of Sports Development John Eno condemned the actions of Libyan authorities who detained the Nigerian Super Eagles and their officials at Al Abrak Airport. The minister expressed serious concern over the team's poor treatment, especially considering their presence in Libya for an, for an international event. He assured Nigerians that the Ministry of Sports Development is collaborating with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other relevant stakeholders to ensure the team's prompt and safe return to Nigeria. The minister urged Libyan authorities to uphold international sports relations and respect the rights of athletes traveling for official events. I've also you know, put it to CAF that there must be an adverse consequence you know, upon you know, you know, the Libyan Football Federation and you cannot achieve that consequence by insisting that the match goes ahead. I mean, otherwise you create a very dangerous precedent and then football that is regarded as a unifier you know, and all that will no longer be a game of football anymore. In a related development, sports enthusiasts in Abuja have actually added their voice and condemned the action. This is football. Yes, we know that sometimes you play antics to win, but this is way beyond the usual uh, football antics or the dark arts. Uh, that it, that which it is called in modern day football. It is way, way beyond what should be. And uh, I think this should be addressed thoroughly by CAF. It depends on what the rule books say. The thing is, um, if a replay is ordered, I expect that uh, the game should be taken away from Libya. Additionally, Super Eagle striker Victor Osime expressed his strong support for his teammates and called for intervention from the Confederation of African Football CAF. After the team faced mistreatment upon arrival in Libya, Osime took to social media to denounce the treatment as uncalled for and inhumane, stirring further concern and calls for action as the Super Eagles withdraw from the AFCON qualifier under such difficult circumstances. For Sports Update, Bright Ebuchu, NTA News.
in the meantime, President Bonati Nubu deeply, is deeply moved by the inhuman treatments endured by the Super Eagles of Nigeria at a Libyan airport and warmly welcomes their safe return to Nigeria. In a statement by his special advisor on information and strategy, Bayo Nonuga, the president says the harrowing experience of the national team at the hands of their hosts and the Libyan authorities prompted the Nigerian Football Federation to withdraw the Super Eagles from the scheduled march on Tuesday. President Tinubu expects the disciplinary board of the Confederation of African Football, CAF, to conduct a thorough investigation and recommends appropriate action against those who willfully violated the organization's statutes and regulations. The president commends the proactive coordination between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Sports Development in addressing the unfortunate episode and ensuring the safe return of Nigerian players. The president applauds the players for keeping their spirits alive despite the excruciating ordeal in Libya. The Nigerian leader recognizes football's unifying power in bringing nations and people together and views the treatment of its citizens as unsportsmanlike and inhumane, a stark contrast to the spirit of the game he deeply appreciates. He very fervently calls on all lovers of the round ladder game and administrators to unite and work collaboratively to prevent and overcome such incidents in the future. Nigeria's First Lady, Senator Oluremi Tunubu, has been in the forefront of championing the cause of women and the youth on many issues ranging from economic empowerment, inclusion to education, and improved healthcare services. The 79th United Nations General Assembly that just ended in New York offered her another opportunity to seek partnerships, support, and grants that will improve the lives of women and youth. Nigeria is open to assistance in that area. It's something I believe that we really, really want to do so that we can have school enrollment up. Odyssey of Esowa, a 25-minute special program on this mission, comes up on the network service of the NTA Today, 14th October 2024. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, stresses the urgent need for ceasefires in both Lebanon and Gaza to avert a broader regional conflict with ramifications for the whole world. Speaking at the start of the UNHCR Refugee Agency's annual executive committee meeting in Geneva, Grandi says a ceasefire that is sustained by a meaningful peace process is the only way to break the cycle of violence, of hatred, of misery. A ceasefire that would also allow the displaced of this conflict in Lebanon and in northern Israel to return home. A ceasefire which would stem the tide to a major regional war with global implications. UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who just returned from Lebanon and neighboring Syria while paying tribute to UNHCR workers killed in the violence, slammed the attacks impacting humanitarian workers. That the lives of humanitarians are dismissed as mere collateral damage, or worse, maligned as somehow culpable or complicit. Despite the attacks, he stressed that the United Nations would stay and deliver. Amid condemnations from Taiwan and the United States, China on Monday ended a day of military drills around Taiwan in which it deployed fighter jets and warships in what it said was a stern warning to separate its forces on the self-ruled island. Chukununso Mwabweze brings us the reports. Beijing announced at around 6 p.m. local time, 13 hours after the drills started, that they had been successfully completed. The drills, dubbed Joint Sword 2024B, had fully tested the integrated joint operation capabilities of its troops, military spokesperson Captain Li Ji said in a statement. Beijing has not ruled out using force to bring Taiwan under its control, and Monday's drills represented its fourth round of large-scale war games in just over two years. 
The United States said China's actions were unwarranted and risk escalation as it called on Beijing to act with restraint. President Lai ching te who took over office in May, has been more outspoken than his predecessor in defending Taiwan's sovereignty, angering Beijing, which calls him a separatist. Lai vowed Monday to protect democratic Taiwan and safeguard national security, while the defense ministry said it had dispatched appropriate forces in response to the drills. As the country heightened alert at the outlying islands administered by Taipei, Taiwan Defense Ministry said it detected 125 Chinese aircraft, including fighter jets and drones, as well as 17 warships around the island between 5.02 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. local time. Beijing said its exercises served as a stern warning to separatist acts of Taiwan independence forces. Taiwan said four formations of China Coast Guard ships had patrolled the island and briefly entered its restricted waters, but not its prohibited waters. Chukunon Songwa NTN News. The Nobel Prize in Economics has been awarded to Turkish-American Darren Asimoglu and British-Americans Simon Johnson and James Robinson. Chukunon Songwa reports that the trio were honored by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences for research into wealth inequality between nations. The jury said by examining the various political and economic systems introduced by European colonizers, the three professors demonstrated a relationship between societal institutions and prosperity. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences Committee for Economic Sciences Prize emphasized that the laureates demonstrated the importance of societal institutions towards achieving the reduction in the vast differences in income between countries. The jury highlighted the trio's work in illuminating how political and economic institutions play a role in explaining why some countries prosper while others do not. Their insights show us that work on promoting democracy, more inclusive institutions, is an important way forward for promoting economic development and closing the world income gap. In addition, the jury noted that the laureate research also helped explain why some countries become trapped in a situation of low income growth. The academy said differences between nations could be traced back to the institutions built up by colonial powers. Why are rich countries so much richer than poor countries? Or why are poor countries so poor? Why do they remain poor for so long? And the three laureates have studied that question a little, little bit over 20 years ago. They started and uh, they've reached, we think, very interesting and very useful conclusions. Speaking via telephone from Athens as the award was announced on Monday in Stockholm, Achemogu said that the economies of countries that democratize, starting from a non-democratic regime, grow faster than non-democratic regimes. Uh, this is a time when demo democracies are, are going through a rough patch, and, and it is in some sense quite crucial that they reclaim the high ground of better governance, cleaner governance, and delivering sort of the promise of democracy to a broad range of people. Darren Achemogu, 57, and Simon Johnson, 61, are professors at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, while James Robinson, 64, is a professor at the University of Chicago. The Economics Prize wraps up this year's Nobel season, which honored achievements in artificial intelligence for the Physics and Chemistry Prizes, the Peace Prize, the Literature Prize, as well as the Medicine Prize. The Nobel Prizes consist of a diploma, a gold medal, and a $1 million reward. Winners will receive their awards at ceremonies in Stockholm and Oslo on December 10th, the anniversary of the 1896 death of scientist and prize creator Alfred Nobel Chukunon Songwa Bweze, NTN News. Stay with NT International for more stories after the break. Did you know that President Bola Tinubu has approved the suspension of import duties and tariffs on rice, maize and other essential food items? Next month, the President has also approved the suspension of import 
export duties on pharmaceutical raw materials and equipment. This will help bring down the prices of food and drugs across the country. All hands are on deck to ensure that things get better for all Nigerians. This is the renewed hope. The Nigerian Television Authority has pledged continuous commitments to projecting the voices of women and girls for proper gender mainstreaming in national developments. The pledge was reaffirmed by the Director General of the NTA, Salihu Abdul Hamid Dembos, while receiving an award of honor presented by the Association of Nigerian Female Students. Ngozi Technikyo reports that the DG was represented as the occasion by the general manager of NTA International, Oganya Simon. The director general, alongside other awardees, shared the passion and inspiration of the founder of the Association of Nigerian Female Students, which is to bridge the gender gap in leadership position of the umbrella body of Nigerian students, where only two positions were reserved for female students out of 15 while urging female students to see challenges not as a barrier, but as a stepping stone to achieve great heights, they were also advised to be committed to their academic pursuit. The DG got this award for giving voice to issues relating to women and the girl child, and his message to them is that impossibilities should cease in their dictionary. They should know that there is no limit to what they can achieve. It's not just about domesticating the gender bills and more importantly, it's about investing in them. To have integrity and pedigree. In everything you do in life, you must have integrity. If you lose that aspect, it's going to be difficult for you in life. Ensuring the proper mentorship of the female undergraduates to deal with the common vices in campuses, stakeholders prefers the antidote. Right and also to bring our female together to come and learn from the feet of our, uh, our leaders. Not getting marks for grade, uh, sex for grades, avoid that. Even when that opportunity comes up, throw it away. You don't need it. And getting skills, payable skills, that can help you raise money while on campus. Not only their voice, I will continue to be their commander to fight for their rights. The Association of Nigerian Female Students used the event to present its Medi magazine to the public. Ngozi Technico, NTA News. Experience has shown that when offenders are brought before the law for interrogation or prosecution, the results of the process usually leaves a deep-seated sense of bitterness and animosity between the offender and victims of the crime. This approach of dispensing justice is giving way to the adoption of a friendly system called restorative justice for the benefit of everyone involved in the process of litigation. Dele Atumbi tells us how. At the dawn of independence, Nigeria began the gradual process of change from the legal and policing systems inherited from the colonial masters towards a homegrown legal system. But that enduring feeling by a victim that the punishment meted out to an offender of a crime did not adequately assuage his feelings of hurt led to the introduction of restorative justice to the Nigerian legal system. This practice aims to repair the harm done to victims by ensuring that offenders take responsibility for their actions irrespective of whether they are found guilty or not. What developed for FCT is a restorative justice bill which will set out a legal framework for operationalizing restorative justice in FCT. It engages offenders victims and the community in a meaningful way, promoting accountability, healing, and rehabilitation. Drawing from his experience on the benefits of restorative justice to promoting communal friendship, Detsu of Kuali in Abuja, Luka Yedo, advocates incorporating community leaders in the process. That offenders should be accountable. By so doing, you will bring healing. You can have a good training manual, you can have a practice direction, and sentencing guidelines, but you need to get the buy-in of stakeholders. 
The UN Office on Drugs and Crimes advocates need for countries to adopt the practice direction is gaining traction in Nigeria with Lagos, Delta, and now the FCT leading the charge in implementing restorative justice model. Stakeholders at the forum on the practice identified the few gray areas which will require some fine tuning and they indicate a readiness for the task. In Abuja, Dele Atumbi. In line with growing efforts to improve cancer care and treatments through innovations, the Nigerian Institute of Cancer Research and Treatments, NICRIT, brings together biomedical engineers and medical physicists for a three-day training in Abuja. Uche Ugochuku reports that the aim is to strengthen the capacities of these experts across the six geopolitical zones of Nigeria. This training is necessitated by the important contributions of biomedical engineers and medical physicists in radiation therapy and diagnostic imaging. They will be re-equipped with the needed knowledge and skills in cancer care and treatments to enable them to perform optimally. Let me assure all stakeholders in the cancer space and indeed all Nigerians that NICRAD will continue to train and retrain all relevant healthcare personnel with a view to improve their capacity for greater productivity and optimal performance in the treatment of all forms of cancers. NICRAT leverages the support of the Federal Ministry of Health and Social Welfare to ensure all categories of healthcare workers in the country are trained. Now, Nigeria is taking new steps to ensure that conflict resolution is no longer a commerce affair to avoid escalation rather than management. To achieve this, the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution has begun training for non-governmental organizations in the North Central Zone Conflict Sensitive Advocacy. The training workshop is to ensure that civil society groups and non-governmental organizations that are in conflict management has the relevant knowledge, experience, and background information of the conflict they intend to resolve. In trying to achieve um, peace in conflict areas, make sure that you don't create more conflict. In trying to edu ensure education of food security in certain places, don't go and create confusion. So, a, a, an understanding of conflict analysis is very imperative for non-governmental organizations to understand it in how they intervene in the respective communities and areas where they do their work. Peace is critical to every other thing we are doing. And peace, security, and development is something that any government should pay attention to. More of conflict prevention, more of conflict sensitivity, more of conflict transformation if we are going to make the necessary change. One organization can do peace work anywhere in the world, not just in Nigeria. So we encourage collaboration, we con encourage coordination and synergy. The training is expected to be extended to other geopolitical zones of the country. Now the 2024 Africa Climate Forum is underway in Abuja. Charles Alpha reports that this year's summit is focusing on how Africa can explore and build resilience tap into its immense renewable energy potentials and forge new partnerships that prioritize both sustainable development and climate action. Africa no doubt has the potential to combat climate issues, but certainly not without some challenges. What this two-day climate forum aims at achieving is how African countries can utilize the unique opportunity to transform from being a continent that bears the disproportionate burden of climate impacts to one that leads in climate solutions and innovation. So what this forum basically is all about is how to galvanize African leaders to be able to look inward and see how can they pull resources together to develop their own climate action plans. We've always sort of gone to these international conferences and go there more like we're begging for, for help, but it's time for Africa to rise. When all is said and done, you need finance to transition. 
the private sector is going to lead it. How are we going to incentivize the private sector to lead this transition? It's really it's crucial. The international Big Cat Alliance, Nigeria is part of it. We need to preserve the fauna uh, to ensure that the ecosystem survives and the nature survives. Differentiated responsibilities for climate financing as well as on uh, renewable energy support in terms of uh, infrastructure as well as technology. Vice President Kashim Shatima in a message to the forum taxed yes. leaders to take bold and decisive climate actions that will secure a just and greener future. Together we can chart a path towards sustainable development and harmonious coexistence with our environment. As we gather yet today to address the future, let us remember the stakes are high and the time for decisive action is now. The theme of this year's conference is Africa's climate future pathways from dependence to leadership. What this means is availing Africa the opportunity to unlock investments and innovations, as well as developing its own energy and climate financing suitable for its peculiar problems. Charles Alpha, NTN News. How best to implement the newly proposed basic education curriculum is the focus of education players at a gathering convened by the Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Mumman. Emphasis was laid on monitoring and supervision framework to ensure the successful rollout of the curriculum in Nigeria. Francis Udojo brings us the story. The minister explains that the revamped curriculum is designed to equip students with essential national going, technical skills actually, that will not only advice. address the challenges Since of quality it. education, but tackles unemployment. Development partners will support the program by providing starter kits to graduating students to help them kickstart learn skills. This NERDC, working with the relevant departments of the ministry, will commence work immediately on senior secondary school. So that by October or September school session of 2025, uh, the one for senior secondary school will also be ready for implementation. For the agencies that are here, I'm happy the Honorable Minister has assembled all of you. You are the implementers. This timeline comes to you. We we'll look forward to your achievement. The Nigerian Research Development Council has three months to put finishing touches to the plans. This phase is complete. Students will be introduced to vocational training to enhance hands on skills. 15 different traits, newly introduced or skills for basic education. So this is the most democratized kind of curriculum that has happened in Nigeria because it addresses different contexts, different stakeholders. So it's the whole representation of the needs that you know Nigeria is looking out for. And I believe this would go a long way in really turning around the education especially the basic education subsector in Nigeria. To prepare teachers for the shift, training programs are in the pipeline and a public awareness campaign will be launched soon to introduce the new curriculum to the border community. Francis Udojo, NT News. Here's a reminder to join us at 8.30 p.m. tonight for the program Odyssey of a SOA a 25-minute special package on the activities of Nigeria's First Lady, Oluremi Tunubu, at the recently concluded 79th United Nations General Assembly. See you then. And this is where we come to the end of the news at 7 for today. We thank you for watching. I'm Lami Ali. F.A. Franklin has been the sign language interpreter.